work uh, full time for NRI from Orlando. And now it's full time from here more than ever before, because usually I'm all around <laughs> Florida, Texas and the southeast. And, um, you know, we've we've been uh, we've been here in Florida. And so um, anyway, I just want to thank you um, for joining. Uh, I wish I could be there with you. I, I was I was telling um, Starley and Kevin on the call, you know, I missed that Texas barbecue. Uh, and, um, you know, we could try to get some cheap imitations here in Orlando, but it's but it's definitely not the same. Uh, so anyway, but I'll look, uh, hopefully look forward to seeing all of you as well in the future in person. And I um, also want to thank um, all of our friends at the Texas Public Charter Schools Association and all of your supporters who are on the, the line as well, in addition to the NRI supporters. And uh, now, um, you know, we've been, we work on so many different issues at NRI. For those of you not familiar with National Review Institute, we are the nonprofit organization that helps support um, all, of, all of the major talent at Nash Review, uh, people like Kevin Williamson. Uh, we have uh, 13 different NRI fellows um, who are, you know, some, like I said, some of the major talent at Nash Review. We also support a lot of different uh, writing projects at National Review Magazine and at nashreview.com, including our new Capital Matters project. If you haven't heard about it yet, it's brand new just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, focuses on financial and economic news coverage with a National Review sensibility. So we, uh, we uh, look forward to having you come over and, and look at um, the Capital Matters page and, and all that we have there. And we also uh, are excited to partner with the Texas Charter Schools Association. We partner with lots of groups all over the country and uh, like to bring our NRI fellows in conversation with them. So I'm gonna turn it over here to Starley Coleman. Many of you know Starley. Uh, for those of you that don't, she, um, she's the CEO of the Texas Public Charter Schools Association. She'll tell us a little bit more about that, but she has over 20 years experience uh, in public policy. And we were there in Texas with you, Starley. Um, was that about a year and a half ago, I think, where we, uh, we went around with our former NRI fellow, David French, uh, both in Dallas and Austin, and had some really great conversations on moving the ball forward on educational choice in charter schools in Texas. And now we're gonna get some updates from you and some conversation uh, by Kevin Williamson. So Starley, I'll let you take it away now. Thanks so much, Francisco. I appreciate it. And we wish you were here too. Um, in fact, like everybody uh, on, on the um, line today, I'm sure we all wish that we could be in person and we look forward to a time when we are able to be together again. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we are really pleased to be able to partner again with the National Review Institute to host one of their terrific writers, Kevin Williamson who also happens to be a Texan. Um, the Texans are extremely proud of, of, our, um, of our fellow Texans. So we um, are grateful to have um, a great one in Kevin um, and, uh, and are happy to claim all of his talents for Texas. So last month, Kevin wrote an article for National Review called the Collapsing Case Against Charter Schools, which was a review of the really incredible conservative thinker Thomas Sowell's latest book called Charter Schools and Their Enemies. Sowell's book crisply demonstrates that the arguments against charter schools are weak from any perspective. Anti-charter positions really can't be justified by data, certainly not by principle, and not even by public opinion. So Kevin's review of, uh, of his book crisply synthesizes Sowell's main points and the key data that he used to talk about how important charter schools are um, in the context of American public education today. So I have the pleasure of leading the statewide organization that protects charter schools here in Texas and having allies like Kevin help us continue to make the case on both data and principle is a really tremendous asset to our community. So Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to hearing your remarks and engaging in Q&A when you're done. So I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Darley. I'm, um, it's always funny when I get invited to speak by an organization like yours, because I assume that everyone you work with knows a lot more about this subject than I do. But when you, when you write persuasively for a living, you get invited to talk about things that you know less about than the audience for some reason or the other. So um, I remember a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak at the uh, annual meeting of the American Bankruptcy uh, Institute. I'd been writing a lot about municipal bankruptcies at the time. And, uh, but I wondered why they, they invited me to come speak, but I was surprised because it was such a large crowd that came out, but then I found out that Jay Leno was on after me. And uh, so that's what they were really there to see. So always important to keep your uh, actual knowledge and uh, expertise in perspective. I, um, I'm glad you enjoyed the review of the Soul Book, which I recommend to everyone if you haven't read it. It's um, 
it's an excellent, just straightforward presentation of the uh, facts of um, charter school performance in this particular study, which is pretty well tailored, I think, to be a, um, a, as good an apples to apples comparison as you can find. I'm sure most of you have already seen this book, probably already looked at it. And uh, one of the things about this book, though, that I didn't really include in my review that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit now, I guess, which is the first sad piece of business that we have to get to, which is that uh, good results and good arguments, either arguments from data or arguments from principle or even arguments from public opinion are not going to be enough to change the minds of people who are politically opposed to charter schools or politically allied with the enemies of charter schools and the entrenched financial interests that go along with the conventional public schools. Um, you will never ever be good enough for them no matter how good you are. Um, and public opinion won't even help us that much either uh, because as we've seen in a lot of examples, I think while people do tend to uh, broadly favor uh, not only charter schools but other kinds of school choice programs, they don't really move uh, voters very effectively in most races, although we've seen a couple of cases where, where the, the interests of charter schools or other school choice programs have been successfully mobilized. But for instance, it's not going to probably be much of a factor in a presidential race, in a governor's race, um, in a US Senate race, something like that. So the case for charter schools is going to have to be made and won on political grounds and in a political way, and that I'll come back to in a second. But before I talk about that, of course, it is important to acknowledge, I think, that the philosophical case for charter schools precedes the political case for them, and we have to establish that first before we really have a solid intellectual foundation upon which to build and move forward. And uh, one of the things that I think we really should emphasize and talk about in, in, a, in a particular piece of rhetoric that we need to address which is that one of the problems with our education system is the idea of an education system. Um, the kind of traditional one size fits all factory model of thinking is still very much out there, it's still very strong, it's still very influential. And we have to begin, I think, with the premise that there's no right kind of school, whether it's a conventional public school, a public charter, private school, homeschooling, anything else. There is no right model of education any more than there is a right model of healthcare or a right model of almost anything else. Um, our efforts, I think, should be built upon the assumption that we are dealing with what will end up being a diverse and unexpected mix of institutions, pedagogic philosophies, economic arrangements, and um, different things for different kinds of families and different kinds of students. And this necessarily, I think, is embedded into a bigger argument about school choice that isn't really limited to charter schools. And eventually we will have to, I think, make that case as well, even though I understand that in, in many cases, it's not in the short term immediate political interests of charter school advocates to link their cause to other uh, less well accepted, more controversial causes such as voucherization and, and, and things like that. But ultimately these things are going to go hand in hand and I think ultimately they will rise or fall together. Another philosophical problem, if you will, that we have with um, making the case for a model of education that genuinely represents the actual diversity of students and families and people that we're trying to serve is that we often are uncomfortable talking about what the diversity actually means. So there is no one model of education because not everyone wants the same thing out of an education. Uh, some people are looking for job training and life preparation. Uh, some people are looking for liberal education in preparation for additional liberal arts education at the university level. And these are very different uh, models of education. They're very different goals. They're very different outcomes. They require different kinds of curricula, different courses of study, uh, different kinds of faculty. And the experience that we had with what became known as tracking in the uh, second half of the 20th century, I think has really spooked people from talking about the fact that we do have a genuine diversity of students and families, communities we're trying to serve and a genuine diversity of educational goals. But I think we also at some point have to acknowledge that as well 
and talk about it obviously in a way that is sensitive and intelligent and to proceed in a way that is um, genuinely oriented toward trying to serve the best interests of the people who really rely on this for, for that kind of service. But we are still going to have to talk about some things that are controversial and somewhat uh, divisive. And that has to do with just the you know, nature of our excessively egalitarian and excessively democratic society. Uh, so that being said, um, there's a line in a, or a couple of lines in Soul's book that, um, that really got my attention and sort of organized my thinking on this. If you don't mind my reading to them to you, um, he says that, um, what we can do is consider in advance what kind of general principles and specific institutions seem promising. Perhaps the most important of these general principles is that schools exist for the education of children. Schools do not exist to provide ironclad jobs for teachers, billions of dollars in union dues for teachers unions, monopolies for educational bureaucracies, a guaranteed market for teachers college degrees or a captive audience for indoctrinators. And um, with apologies to uh, Thomas Sowell, I don't say these words very often, he's wrong about that. Um, he is writing about what schools should exist to do, uh, but the fact that, that is not what school districts largely exist to do. I do take a pretty cynical um, attitude toward the public school systems, which again may not be very politically useful to uh, the defenders of charter schools, but it's what I actually think about this stuff and that's all I really have to offer you. So. We have to deal, I think, politically with the reality that public school systems are first and foremost patronage programs. Um, they exist to do the things that Thomas Sowell says that they don't exist to do. They do exist to provide above market wages for uh, certain kinds of political constituencies to provide accountability free jobs, lots of union dues which get laundered into political contributions, all the rest of the things that you uh, typically think about with that. And we simply can't uh, allow sentimentality or idealism to cause us to ignore out of existence those facts because you can't ignore them out of existence. They remain facts whether you accept them or, or don't accept them. Um, I was a small town newspaper editor for a long time. And one of the things I learned from that is that school districts and school boards in particular are um, shockingly incompetent and, and more often corrupt than you would think. Uh, in my experience, more often corrupt than other kinds of local government or other kinds of even state and federal government. Uh, there was recently a commentary piece published by the Heritage Foundation about school board corruption. The, uh, the headline was Bad Education. And um, it contains some really interesting <laughs> findings, things that I didn't, didn't even know about and I follow this stuff pretty closely. Uh, so for instance, schools um, recruiting athletes from outside of their district because they care about athletic performance. Um, going so far as to arrange uh, jobs for members of their family and uh, housing and that sort of thing in order to get those kids into their, uh, into their school districts for purely athletic purposes, which of course doesn't serve uh, much of any obvious uh, educational goal. Um, you know, manipulating graduation rates, um, falsifying school records and evidence, that kind of thing. And um, Altogether, these add up to a pretty uh, damning and worrisome picture of how public schools and particularly school boards actually operate. And uh, you know, I remember seeing this in a, in a relatively wealthy uh, suburban school district outside of Philadelphia, where you would see projects bid at $100 million and the bid document is you know, 500 words or something absurdly vague and it ends up being a $300 million project instead of a $100 million project. And this stuff kind of happens uh, one piece at a time. These political realities are bound up in things like the campaign against standardized testing, which is when you think about it in terms of its political outlines and its rhetorical outlines, more or less exactly the same as the arguing against charter schools, which is you know, essentially a campaign of motivated reasoning intellectual dishonesty and borderline fraudulent research designed to delegitimize and, um, and explain away any differences in superior performance that's found among charter schools. So these are the uh, institutions and the people who unfortunately still have the biggest say in how our educational decisions get made. 
And that's particularly worrisome for charter schools right now because um, most of the reform, so-called reform efforts on the left that we're seeing would be measures that would empower school boards and public school districts to uh, make more direct decisions about how charter schools work and how charter schools are operated, particularly a proposal to um, allow school districts to, in essence, veto federal funding for, for charter schools. So this is back to the old, you know, democracy being two wolves and a sheep voting about what to have for dinner. But in one case, I think maybe there is some political opportunity there to take a kind of a agree and amplify approach that every time something comes out that claims to be a reform oriented toward ensuring greater accountability or transparency or uh, financial probity in, in, in charter schools to say, well, yes, we'll accept this. In fact, we'd like to take this and do it 10 times as much, but also you guys you know, play by the same rules. Uh, let's apply these to the school boards, let's apply these to the school districts. And that would be an interesting, I think, fight to have, uh, particularly when it comes to things like open records and open meetings laws, which uh, Starley can probably tell you more about here in Texas, particularly in Dallas, we have some real problems with schools intentionally subverting those things and, uh, and not complying with them. I think this is another instance in which simple openness and availability of information would be an enormous spur to reform. And that is one of the areas where I think we have the best opportunity for, for reform. Uh, to switch gears just a little bit, I'd like to talk about the upcoming election. Um, I'm not much of a political prognosticator, but if I were betting my own money on it, um, my bet would be that uh, Joe Biden wins the presidential election in November. Although that is to be sure by no means certain, but I think it's the more likely outcome. And I think currently that the more likely outcome is that the Biden administration will come into power with a democratic house and a democratic Senate. And I think that these will provide some real challenges and dangers for charter schools around the country. Uh, some of you probably know when uh, Biden secured the nomination, he and Bernie Sanders set up this unity task force as they called it. And uh, there were eight members, two of whom were the heads of the two major teachers unions. And so 25% of the membership were uh, the two leading opponents of charter schools in the country. And the other six members were, were largely hostile as well. And to no one's great surprise, um, they produced a document that is hostile to school choice in general, to charter schools in particular. And if you've looked at the document itself and the rhetoric surrounding it, um, two things are obvious. One is that the mode of proceeding against charter schools will be principally financial, uh, which is to say to reduce funding for them or to create new barriers to funding and strings attached to the funding that cost charter schools to essentially stop being charter schools. And the moral argument attached to that is going to be essentially that charter schools are racist. And um, this is of course an absurd and preposterous and outrageous claim, especially when you consider that charter schools not only serve disproportionately minority uh, communities, but also on average do a considerably better job of it than the conventional public schools do. But um, that is the general direction this is going to take. And the uh, rhetoric, if you look at it, talks about, if I can quote from the document here again, about schools being saddled with a private profit motive. Um, really, there's a tendency to exaggerate the, uh, the role of for-profit institutions and charter schools, as you all know, and um, an unwillingness to distinguish between actual for-profit for-profit charters, which are a relatively small number of schools and charters that contract with for-profit businesses to provide various kinds of management services, which are two very different things, but they're gonna be lumped together. Um, there's talk in the same document about the need for quote, more stringent, stringent guardrails to ensure charter schools are good stewards of federal education funds. Again, it would be nice if they also ensured that public school districts were good stewards of education funds. and. Maybe we should agree with that and try to um, try to push forward some things on that as well. Uh, but he goes on to talk about things like transparency, uh, civil rights protections, racial equity, admissions practices, disciplinary procedures, school finances. So they will be looking for pressure points to uh, essentially convert charters into more conventional public schools. Um, even without revoking the charters, they can more or less force them to um, 
behave as though they were conventional public schools. And that is where I would expect the, 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 the strongest impetus for interference and hindrance to come from. And as I mentioned earlier, there is um, talk not only in, in California, but also at the federal level of giving school districts veto power over federal funding for local charter schools. And that would, in most cases, probably amount to a prohibition of federal funding for charter schools, uh, because school districts will do everything they can to uh, hamper and, uh, and disadvantage charter schools. With a few exceptions, there are a couple of public school districts that um, take a different view of this, but, but, but mostly that is not how that's going to work out. We should also be on the lookout for very vague criteria. Uh, so for example, um, the language around things like civil rights and racial equity, disparity, um, whether it's serving the neediest students and that sort of thing is all, is all pretty vague. And that vagueness creates an opportunity for discretion of various kinds. And that discretion of course is not what you want because discretion is in that case, really an invitation to, um, to abuse, corruption, bullying, log rolling, all the other things that we are used to seeing those things. And um, California, again, to go back to that, um, their, their, their new charter school law has a clause in there that says they can essentially shut things down if they judge the charter is, quote, unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community. Um, that is in particular the kind of very vague uh, language that I think we should be on the lookout for because there's essentially no way to adjudicate that in any empirical or rational way. It, it ends up being a purely subjective call. And I think that the advocates of charter schools can pretty well count on subjective calls going against them in most cases. Uh, so to wrap up a couple of uh, things about strategies going forward. Um, one is that litigation is going to play a big role in this and we will have to support pro-charter litigation in California and uh, if necessary in Texas and around the country. Um, Indiana, I guess, has a case going on and everywhere that there is um, you know, pro-charter school litigation, it's going to require both political and financial support. Um, again, we should really make an effort to keep these very vague uh, performance criteria from being written into the law to the extent that we can make it uh, some objective measure, uh, we should um, force that issue as much as it's possible to do. Uh, we should be looking at changes in higher education right now, mostly in response to the coronavirus epidemic and think about ways in which charter schools can better integrate themselves into a kind of contiguous system that uh, feeds into that. I know in Utah, there are two very popular uh, online charters one of which has seen a thousand extra applications uh, this year over what they saw last year, the other which has seen 1500 more. So there's a great deal of uh, demand in the market for that kind of service right now. And we should certainly be looking at ways to figure out what the new normal is and figure out how charter schools can be of the most use and the most service uh, in that new normal. And again, we don't really know what that's going to be, which brings me back to my opening point that we have to keep ourselves open to a diversity of outcomes, a diversity of models and a, and a diversity of solutions. So as I said before, I think that the um, political problems facing charter schools in the near term are serious. I think that the need for reform is urgent. And while I certainly understand that uh, charter schools and their advocates have their own immediate political interests that need defending. I hope that eventually they will grow out of their more defensive posture and into a more robust positive advocate for fundamental reform of our education system across the board in ways not merely limited to the case of public charters. So again, thank you for your time and for your attention. I hope this has been of some use and I'll be happy to take your questions now. Okay, I'm back here, uh, Kevin. Um, so if, for those of you who uh, would like to ask a question or, or make a comment, um, if you wouldn't mind doing so, there's a little chat box here on your screen for those of you who are, are coming in on the computer. Um, I do have a question here. Um, obviously we saw Meg Wilson's comment that I think you reacted to Kevin about Thomas Sowell's book. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, a great new book on charter schools. It's hard to believe. I think Thomas Sowell just turned 90 years old. Did, um, yes. <laughs> so, uh, but 
Uh, one question someone has is how do we square what you mentioned about charter schools generally doing better to serve students of color um, and also yet not necessarily getting support from lawmakers of color? Um, what would, any reactions there? Yeah, well, I think that we have to be realistic about the way political coalitions actually work. And um, most non-white lawmakers in this country are Democrats, uh, overwhelmingly, that is the case. And that puts them into a political coalition with the teachers unions who provide the Democratic Party with its most reliable source, uh, not only of campaign contributions, um, but also a tremendous amount of outside spending. And probably its most important source of uh, you know, foot soldiers and, and leg work. So we, we see this all the time where, um, you know, I know a bit about Philadelphia because I, I ran newspapers there for a while. And um, among African-Americans in Philadelphia who are a large part of the population, there's a tremendous amount of support, at least on paper, for school choice of all kinds, not only charter schools, but vouchers and, and other sorts of things. Um, it has no effect on how those communities vote. Um, and it has no effect on how lawmakers behave. So uh, that's a, it's a tough political nut to crack. And this is the difficult thing for conservatives, I think in particular, simply because we have for various reasons, some of them unfair caricatures, some of them mistakes and political calculations of our own, allowed ourselves to become essentially the political enemy of people who are not white in this country. So people who are black, people who are Hispanic, uh, immigrants overwhelmingly feel more welcome in the Democratic Party and the Democratic Coalition than they do on the right. I think that's uh, it's an unfortunate fact of life, but that's where we are. And we're not going to be able to move the political needle on that to use a cliche that I hate and I can't believe this came out of my mouth, but we're not going to achieve a lot of progress on that just by making arguments about charter schools, no matter how good those arguments are, no matter how strong the data is, no matter how undeniable the advantages are, it's part of a bigger bundle of political and social issues that are gonna to have to be dealt with. And so long as people, uh, particularly democratic lawmakers think, well, the student, uh, the teachers unions are our friends and the school reformers are our enemies, that's where we start and that's where we stop. We have to change that conversation first. Yeah, and I'll just add my own comment there as well. You know, I worked uh, for the James Madison Institute in Tallahassee, Florida for about nine years. And one thing I observed there is uh, obviously Florida is, you know, one of the leaders, if not the leader in, in educational choice in this country. And actually, we had a, a number of uh, black lawmakers who were also Democrats who were became supporters of various uh, educational choice programs. And in fact, it's becoming more of a bipartisan issue in Florida. It's not totally there. On school choice, but uh, you know, there's a lot of different school choice elements from charter schools to tax credit scholarships, and so some people like one thing over the other. But I think charter schools seem to be the more uh, the, the more easily acceptable thing uh, for most lawmakers, probably in some ways because they're still public schools as well, uh, even yeah. though they operate differently. Um, and then the the other thing I was going to uh, just mention there, um, we do have a, a comment here um, from uh, someone here that says. Uh, also, rural Republicans, um, often white, uh, often also do not support charters right. uh, or other educational choice. And how do we help those lawmakers understand that charters shouldn't just be an urban phenomenon? Yes, we help them by punishing them. Uh, now, this is actually a very good point. And this spoke to my earlier um, observations about how school districts actually work. So there's tremendous financial and economic interest attached to the public schools. Um, in a lot of places, particularly rural areas that don't have a lot of business outside of agriculture, uh, government's the largest employer. Generally, the public schools are the largest subset within that. And, um, you know, in a lot of places, you know, even like where I grew up, um, you know, it's if you're looking for a, a high paying job, um, this, this goes completely against the way we talk about this stuff. But school, school districts are a good way to find one of those. Um, you know, if you are um, superintendent of schools in Lubbock, Texas, uh, you, uh, last time I checked, I think he made around $300,000 a year or something like that. So um, there aren't a lot of $300,000 a year jobs in a place like that. And if you go to truly rural areas, of course, you, um, you find an even larger disparity. So Republicans are not immune from the sorts of problems that we talk about in public choice. 
Uh, they're not immune from simple uh, short-term self-interest seeking. We know this about Republicans. We've met Republicans. We know what they're like. And um, we have to keep making the case um, not as though it were a Republican versus Democrat issue also, uh, because Republicans can be allies, Democrats can be allies, Republicans can be opponents, Democrats can be opponents. But one of the unhappy things about our current political moment is that the increasing tribalization of American politics, uh, dividing the whole thing into two cultural camps who are mutually antagonistic, is that you get a lot less diversity within the coalitions than you used to. So for a long time, it was completely unobjectionable to have or unsurprising to have a whole lot of Democrats who were, for instance, pretty good on the Second Amendment. So you would get Democrats from rural areas who um, had you know, gun culture at home. They had people in their constituencies who cared a lot about hunting and having access to firearms for agricultural purposes and such. And this was completely uncontroversial thing. Um, even when Harry Reid was the Senate Majority Leader, he had very high rankings from the uh, National Rifle Association because he was good on that issue. In 2020, I think it's a lot less likely that someone who had uh, good views about the Second Amendment would be welcome on the left side of the uh, on the left side of the aisle, and uh, that certainly goes for other things too. Unfortunately, one of those things is is school reform. So, to the extent that we can keep charter schools from being completely bundled up as a culture war issue, I think we should certainly pursue that to the extent that it's possible. And uh, I'm not sure how much opportunity there, there really is to keep that from happening. Uh, but I do think that emphasizing the public character of charter schools certainly helps that. Uh, certainly making arguments of the kind that Thomas Sowell has and others have, showing in a really conclusive way that these schools are good for people who are poor, people who are not white, uh, people who live in areas that generally suffer from poor social services and poor government services. And um, those kinds of cases, I think, can really help take some of the edge off the opposition anyway. Although, again, you're dealing with a form of coalitional politics that's really very difficult to budge. Kevin, uh, last summer, NRI actually did a program in Dallas uh, where you were featured along with Mark Janis. And hmm. so um, that, I thought about that because I see Meg Wilson's question here. Meg's down in Austin, but she says, how do we get more information about the Janus decision to regular school teachers, uh, which could potentially drive uh, the move to charters in the long term? You know, when I first started writing uh, opinion journalism, I was worried about being repetitious. Um, have already written this column before, some version of this column before. What I've learned over the years is that people need to be told 20 or 25 times before they really start to get the message on something. Um, and this is not to be condescending, it's perfectly reasonable. You know, people have lives of their own. They don't spend all their time thinking about public policy and political problems. Um, this is what economists call rational ignorance. Uh, people don't uh, have moonlighting positions as public policy researchers and advocates and that sort of thing. So I think the thing to do to get information to teachers is to get information to teachers, to um, keep sending them mailings, keep sending them emails, keep sending them communications, keep having speakers come talk about this stuff, get Mark Janis to come talk about it, or Jack Fowler, who wrote the article for National Review about that decision. Um, you know, there's the question of advocacy, but there's also the pre-existing issue of simply informing people about things. And informing people about things is a really difficult and expensive proposition. I know, I used to run newspapers. We tried to inform people about stuff that costs a tremendous amount of money and you receive very little thanks for it. So um, repetition helps, and uh, but keep in mind that this is gonna be a years long project of getting people simply to understand the basics of what their rights are, what the actual uh, legal situation is under Janus, and um, killing off the myths and uh, preconceptions about what people's legal duties and obligations are and what their relationships to these labor unions actually is will take a very long time and we should uh, go into this, you know, knowing that it's gonna be a long fight. Kevin, I've got a question here from Lee Danner down in Houston. I miss seeing Lee. I know we, we all missed the National Review Cruise this year, which Lee's usually on, but uh, yeah. uh, he says, is the, uh, I think he's referring to Los Angeles, the LA uh, Teachers Union really serious with their demand to stifle charter schools by reducing police funding um, before they will return to work? and also asked how this is all related to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, I'm not sure about the relationship between the police funding issue and, and charter schools. So this is something that um, I can't really speak to. I can tell you that the California teachers unions and in Los Angeles in particular are very serious about uh, stifling charter schools. Um, they would abolish them tomorrow if they could, uh, creating a situation in which the school boards have veto funding over non-local funding for or veto power over non-local funding for charters is um, going to amount to essentially a prohibition of, of federal funds for charter schools. So um, COVID contributes to this in the sense that emergencies always create political opportunities. You know, this goes back to Robert Higgs and crisis and Leviathan and all those arguments that we all know so much about that um, every time there's an unfamiliar situation with a genuine emergency, uh, genuine social disruption, genuine institutional disruption, it creates opportunities for change, uh, positive change or negative change. Unfortunately, we, we suffer from the uh, ongoing problem of you know, distributed costs versus uh, or concentrated benefits versus distributed costs. So the people who are opponents of charter schools have very strong personal financial reasons to be at the forefront of this fight. And they have very strong personal financial reasons to bully state, local and national officials into going along with them. People who are acting from more general principles as part of a broader campaign of social reform, um, but who aren't going to lose a paycheck if things don't go their way, simply don't have the same incentives. And um, you add that to the fact that we were talking about earlier that public schools are enormous employers. They're economically important to a lot of communities. It's a politically very difficult situation to deal with. Francisco, if I could just jump in. Um for one second on this, one of the things that I think is fascinating too about this issue of um, uh, unions striking over, um, you know, COVID, seemingly COVID related stuff. Um, one of the things that I think is really fascinating is about 10 days ago, the, um, the president of the biggest teachers union in the country, the American Federation for Teachers, um, uh, issued um, a statement saying that they had authorized teachers in Florida, Arizona, and Texas to strike uh, over, um, over, over COVID-related stuff. Now, there's a couple of things that are fascinating about those three states in particular. One is um, all of them, uh, in every single one of those states, it's illegal for teachers to strike. Um, the second thing is, um, all of those states are um, swing states in the presidential election this year. Not only swing states for the presidential election, but their legislatures are um, up for grabs this year as well, um, including here in Texas. So you think about that. They are authorizing and encouraging teachers. So in a, in a state like Texas um, and Florida and Arizona, where it's illegal to strike, they're encouraging them to do things like um, sick outs, walkouts, seemingly over things like PPE, right? Or, or you know, not being forced to go back to campus before, uh, before a teacher wants to. They're, they are authorizing that to happen through the election. So what does that mean, right? If teachers don't have to go uh, to campus um, because they're striking, or on a sick out or on a walkout, they're free, right, to campaign uh, on behalf of union-backed candidates who are um, under tremendous pressure, um, uh, to, you know, to, to pass a litmus test that is that is explicitly anti-charter. Um, so this is a it's a really fascinating political situation that we find ourselves in. Like the, the you know the the COVID crisis is real for schools and for charter schools too, right? There's a lot of stuff that they're trying to navigate right now that um, you know we just have not. I mean you can do a lot of planning, but planning for a global pandemic has really not been um, at the top of any of our school leaders' list. But when you think about the political implications of what the union is pushing teachers um, in swing states to do, it's really, really fascinating. And um, it's gonna be really fascinating to watch over the next 75 days. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have to understand the sort of fanatical character of the, uh, the, the folks we're dealing with. If there were news that broke tomorrow that there was an asteroid headed toward earth and that in 25 days it was gonna hit the earth and a billion people were gonna die, these people would say, what we really need to do is abolish charter schools. First thing, you know, never mind the asteroid, 
maybe we can do something about the asteroid. Maybe we can try to, you know, one of these late 1990s asteroid movies uh, projects. I don't know, but the first thing is get rid of charter schools. And it doesn't matter what the public health issue is, what the public crisis is, um, they will use this as an argument against charters, even if it's completely unrelated as COVID largely is. Well, good question here from uh, Ron Decker that's probably related to this conversation. Uh, why is the discussion limited to the political aspects rather than the, the, the need to provide better results? I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. I think he's just uh, um, trying to ask about what, um, you know, what, why is there so much political opposition um, in terms of, instead of just looking at the results of charter schools themselves? Right, yeah, because nobody cares about the results. <laughs> because um, again, with apologies to Thomas Sowell, schools don't exist to educate students. Schools exist to be a patronage network. And um, hopefully we can get this patronage network to provide some decent educational results. A lot of them do. But um, you know, politically, economically, that is, that is where things are. So if arguments from data were sufficient, we would have won this argument and the issue would have been closed years ago, decades ago. Um, but the fact is, this is a political dispute and it's gonna be solved politically. Well, we're running into uh, some time here, but I, I think this next question, perhaps you both can answer, maybe Starley can answer more. Um, would it help if we rally the base in Texas, uh, get locals who are supportive of school choice and charters elected to school boards and the State Board of Education that comes from Paul Ivey? Um. Uh, Paul, you're speaking my love language. Um, yes, <laughs> yes, it would. It would help tremendously. Um, here in Texas, charter schools are actually authorized by the state, by the State Board of Education. So um, we don't have to worry so much about local school boards uh, in Texas um, as we do the school, the State Board of Education. But you know, our one of our real challenges here in Texas is that um, over the last couple of years, uh, our our pro charter majority, which is bipartisan in Texas, our pro charter majority in the state house and state senate has um, shrunk dramatically. Um, here's an example. Um, 25 years ago when the charter school law was passed it was introduced as Senate Bill 1 by Democrats um, in the Texas legislature, which the, the House and Senate were both controlled by Democrats at the time. George W. Bush was our, was our brand new governor. Um, bill passed overwhelmingly in the Senate and the House. The, the, the count uh, for, for folks who um, said yes to that bill um, 25 years ago was 113 to 33 um, in the state house. Today, our pro-charter majority in the state house has shrunk to 78 to 72. We have a six vote margin in the Texas state house of pro-charter uh, lawmakers. So we have a real challenge on our hands, um, not only at the State Board of Education, which is getting also getting tighter and tighter for us, but at the state legislature as well. The Texas Charter School Association has a sister organization that does the political work for charters here in Texas. It's called Charter Schools Now. Charter Schools Now um, is a C4 and also has a political action committee that's um, working really hard um, this election cycle to make sure that we protect that pro-charter majority in the state house and senate. Um, we'd be glad to talk to you about that um, anytime you'd like. Uh, you can you can find us easily online. Um, uh, but but that is a real um, that is a real issue for us here in Texas. Um, we have got to rally the base and it's sort of someone asked the question too about rural lawmakers i mean in a state like texas you know we cannot count on all republicans just being good for school choice or, or and charter schools specifically we just can't count on that so we have to make sure that we are rallying the base getting people elected to office making this a priority issue when we go to the ballot box ourselves yeah i don't have a lot to add to that but i'm um, just as an indicator of what the politics here are like here's a little story for you uh an illustrative anecdote. In uh, 2008, when he was running for president, Barack Obama had a meeting in uh, New York, a fundraiser with a bunch of Wall Street guys. And uh, he gave a talk about his frustration with the teachers unions and the public schools, their efforts to frustrate reforms and, um, and how they simply were not serving the interests of the people they were there supposed to serve. Um, I was told about this by a pretty reliable source, I believe it. And he said, apparently, you know, I'm this close to coming out as an open advocate of school choice, because I think it's really important. 
And then he was elected president. And as you all probably are acutely aware, never said a word about it. Not one word ever came out of his mouth about it, as far as I'm aware. And, um, you know, he in 2008, 2009, and toward the end of his presidency, was politically untouchable. He could have done whatever he wanted. Uh, he could have opened up that discussion. He could have done it in a way that was uh, less disruptive to his party's political interest than it otherwise might be. Uh, but he chose just to completely keep his hands off of it. And um, so if it's, if it's that difficult for someone like that to come around on the issue, uh, I think that we have to be realistic what that means for our state and local politicians and people who are more worried about their uh, personal, financial, and political interests in the near term than someone who's recently been elected president of the United States would be. Great. Well, I want to just kind of thank you both uh, and thank everybody on the call. I know we've come to a, a close here of our time. Um, and um, for those of you, as Starley mentioned, that want to get involved locally in Texas with the Texas Public Charter School Association, just Google them right there and you'll find their website. Uh, they do really great work. We've been happy to partner with them on so many uh, you know, events and, and uh, we, we love just seeing the progress being made there and a lot of work ahead, of course. And, you know, I, I always say I'm going to give a shout out to my friends, Brendan and Randon Steinhauser, who will probably watch this later. But, uh, you know, they always tell me how conservative Texas is. And we have this battle between Florida and Texas for jobs and all sorts of things. But I always tell them, you guys got to catch up with Florida on school choice. <laughs> so, but anyway, we look forward to cheering you guys on. Um, and, uh, and hopefully you guys um, will we'll keep, keep plugging ahead there and, and convince those lawmakers to, to make the right decisions on educational choice. And for those that want to learn more about National Review Institute, feel free to visit our website as well, nrinstitute.org, or shoot me a message. And also, and I should also give a shout out to Kevin Williamson because he has the cover article of the latest National Review magazine. Um, Karl Marx is back in full force, and he's here to talk about it. So uh, uh, check that that out as well. You can you can find Kevin's work um, there at nationalreview.com as well. So Starley, you want to make any last comments? Thanks everybody for joining us. This was a great conversation. We look forward to partnering with NRI again soon. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you all.